Even if there has been no shortage previously or even now of those who consider the French bulldog as a native of France, the majority of experts favour the theory that its origins are to be found in the small bulldogs reaching France from England. Here are the two theories. Those who think that the breed's origins are French, and among these is the known dog expert N.M. Martin, believe that it derives from small, powerful, but little-known stud farm dogs widespread in some Parisian suburbs, later crossbred with short-muzzled dogs from Belgium. Though admitting some crossbreeding with bulldogs and Carlini, these experts retain that the breed was formed in France and justify its name with the notable similarity with the bulldog. For the supporters of this theory, the French bulldogs were the companions of porters, coachmen and butchers who used them to chase rats and in bloody fights between dogs. It's an interesting theory, which however does not find confirmation in any written document and in no artistic representation. The French bulldog, for breeding interests, suddenly materialised in France towards the middle of the 19th century and immediately began its rise towards success. Instead, those who see the ancestors in the bulldogs from England explain that some small bulldogs started to be born in Great Britain towards the first decades of the 19th century, almost certainly as a result of crossbreedings between bulldogs and other breeds, among which the Carlino and most probably also the Manchester Terrier that apparently led to erect ears. According to the supporters of such a theory, these crossbreedings were carried out precisely to obtain dogs of smaller sizes to be used in ratting that was increasingly catching on, or to be used to fertilise the female bulldogs in view of their first pregnancies, since the large heads that were becoming more and more frequent and in demand caused serious problems, which at the time were almost impossible for the primiparous dogs to resolve. These dogs initially gained moderate public success in England, but then declined and became the companions of humble folk. Thus, the small bulldogs that were born in England, not considered valuable in their native land, arrived in France towards the middle of the 19th century, crossing the channel with English miners and workers who went there in search of work. Many of these emigrants were from Nottingham, the chief town of the county of Nottinghamshire, also where intense breeding of these small dogs took place that were commonly called toy bulldogs. They occupied little space in the modest homes of the miners and besides performed an invaluable service chasing rats from the houses. The people who emigrated to France after having settled often asked those staying in Great Britain to send them the small bulldogs so as to have a fragment of their country near them. Thus, it was the start of a flourishing trade of toy bulldogs between England and France. It is known that a certain Harrison imported some small toy bulldogs, excellent ratters, in 1885 from France, and still another gentleman named J. Posno, also English, won a ratting competition with a French bulldog. In 1904, the Illustrated Kennel News published a drawing of 1849 which portrayed a small one-year-old bulldog called Nottingham Frank, weighing about 22 pounds, 10 kilograms, and owned by a certain William Tupper from London, who possessed numerous other specimens of similar type. This toy bulldog bore a striking resemblance, except for its long tail, to the future French bulldogs. Even if one accepts the theory of distant English origins as being true, which however seems very likely, France is credited with having enthusiastically welcomed the small bulldogs, having selected and fixed their type, getting them recognised by the official dog breeders and having confirmed their worldwide success. The attribution of the breed's paternity to this country by the International Dog Federation is therefore correct and sacrosanct. Towards the end of the 19th century, more precisely between 1880 and 1890, also Austria already had some kennels of small bull that directly originated from England. In Vienna, the society accolade of the small bulldogs was granted when the Prince of Coburg imported Snob in 1888, thus imposing the breed on the court. Another important character of Viennese high society was the owner of the hotel Erzherzog Karl, who also imported a toy bulldog. 
Both these dogs originated from England and both were white and dappled. It is believed that the preference of the Viennese for this colour derives from this detail, while in France the striped coat was usually preferred. The French bulldogs bred in Austria had a more compact structure which more closely resembled the bulldog from England, and even today an expert eye in any case is able to distinguish between bulldogs deriving from ancestors of Austrian or French origin, despite the fact that the two types are now well mixed between them. As for the worldly popularity of the French bulldog in Austria, Mrs. Sacker should also be remembered. She was a colourful and very characteristic figure from Vienna at the end of the 19th century, who always went around with a cigar in her mouth and used the informal you form of address, even with the emperor. She was always surrounded by a pack of bulldogs and acted with a determined and resolute manner with everybody, even with the most powerful people. Another of the characteristics of the French bulldogs bred in Austria was their ears, and rows or semi-erect forms were certainly admitted in that country until 1909. Back in England, there was a notable sensation in the bulldog world when, in 1893, Mr. J. R. Krehl presented out of competition to a show organised by the English Kennel Club some small, odd dogs called Lisette, Saida, Rayon d'Or, Riquette, Jeanne La Folle that he had recently imported from France. A class for these French bulldogs or toy bulldogs that weighed less than 20 pounds, 9 kilos, was provided for by the Kennel Club the following year for its annual show. Since 1885, the French enthusiasts of the breed have gathered in the Bulldog Club Francais, later meeting regularly in a cafe of Rue saint Savarin in Paris to discuss various matters concerning the French bulldog. The same year, 1885, saw the opening of the pedigree books kept by the club. In 1888, the club drew up an initial list of the characteristics that a good specimen must possess. It should be noted as a curiosity that in this first description, the ears were required in the rose or tulip form, which at that time were typical of the bulldog from England, while the so-called bat, that is erect ears, were just accepted. In 1898, the drive of Prince of Wagram and Gordon Bennett led to the founding of a new club called Club de Bulldog Francais, the same year the French Bulldog was recognised by the Société Centrale Canina of Paris, which emanated a standard that only admitted fully erect ears. The first appearance in a French show took place in 1887. The standard was then amended in 1931, 1932 and in 1948. Then it was completely revised in 1986 by H. F. Réan and R. Triquet, and finally, in 1994, by the Comité du Club du Bulldog Français, again with the collaboration of R. Triquet. It is certain that at least until 1909, the Austrians disregarded the indications of the standard that envisaged only bat ears, and they also admitted the specimens with rose ears to their shows. In 1912, only after the International Dog Federation had officially registered the breed, did this country also accept, like England, erect ears in the French Bulldog. The Toy Bulldog Club was founded in England in 1898. Again in Great Britain, the French Bulldog Club of England was founded in 1902, which in April of 1903 organised a show in which no less than 58 very typical and uniform specimens were presented. The following year saw 94 dogs take part, and on account of this success, the Kennel Club granted the club recognition in 1905. The French Bulldog is a dog of French origin, a watchdog and a dog to be kept for company, and is not subjected to work tests. Its general appearance is of a small-sized molossoid, 
powerful even in its small dimensions, short-limbed with smooth hair and a short and snub-nosed muzzle. The ears should be straight, the tail naturally short. It must appear active, intelligent, very muscular, compact and with a strong skeleton. The head must be very strong, wide and square, covered by symmetrical lines with a short muzzle. The cranium must be practically flat, the front rounded and with prominent superciliary arches, separated by a well-developed sulcus between the eyes. This sulcus must not extend on the front and the occipital crest must be little developed, very accentuated stop. The nose must be wide, very short and turned upwards. The well-opened asymmetrical nostrils are obliquely turned backwards. These characteristics, however, must allow natural respiration. Short, wide front and with concentric and symmetrical lines that descend until the upper lips. Wide, square and powerful jaws. The lower one describes a forward curve going beyond the upper one. Enognathism is a serious defect and the lower incisors must never be visible with the mouth closed. The jaws must not show any deviation or asymmetry. The upper lips descend rounded, completely covering the teeth. The masseters should be well developed but not protruding. The eyes should be low set, far from the nose and the ears with an attentive expression, fairly big, round and of dark colour. The white of the eyes must not be visible when the dog looks ahead and the eyelids must not be black. The ears should be of average size, wide at the base and rounded at the tops, situated high on the cranium and not too near each other, held absolutely straight. The auricles open forwards and the skin should be soft to the touch. Short neck, slightly bent and without dewlap. The dorsal line is gradually raised at the level of the kidneys to then redescend rapidly towards the tail. This form is much sought after and is an indication of a short kidney. The dorsum is broad and muscular, a wide and short kidney and an oblique crupper. Cylindrical chest well descended with rounded ribs, very open, raised abdomen. Short tail attached low, thick at the junction, naturally knotted or broken and pointed towards the end. It should never be able to be raised above the dorsal line. A relatively short tail, it should never surpass the hock, is allowed but not sought after. Front limbs with regular plumb lines viewed both from the front as well as from the side, short shoulders with good and apparent musculature, short legs with elbows that are closely attached to the body, short and muscular forelegs, solid carpi and metacarpi, small and rounded feet, slightly rotated outwards. The digits should be compact and the claws short and big. Dark coats should have black ones, while coats with abundant white and tawny ones may have light ones. The rear limbs should be strong, muscular and a little bit longer than at the front. Regular plumb lines, muscular thighs and not too rounded, well descended hocks, neither too angled nor, above all, too straight. Solid and short tarsi and metatarsi without dewlaps, compact feet, easy gait. Smooth haired coat, bright and soft. The admitted colours are uniform tawny, striped briguet and striped tawny. All shades of tawny are admitted, from red to milky coffee colour. Completely white dogs are classified among the striped tawny ones with invasive white patches once known as kai. If a dog has a dark nose, eyes and edges of the eyelids, some light depigmentation of the muzzle of very handsome dogs could be excused. The weight varies between 8 to 14 kilos and the size is proportionate to the weight.
The French Bulldog is an extraordinary dog, perfectly adapted to living alongside man in the context of modern society. In the first place, it is a dog of small dimensions. With its approximately 30 centimeters of height at the withers, it represents a companion that occupies little space. And this is a very important aspect, especially for those living in small apartments and maybe in big cities. Still referring to city and apartment life, another very important characteristic that the breed possesses is that of having short and odorless hair, which allows it to live within the family, even in restricted spaces without causing any problems. At home and in the car, the French Bulldog proves an attentive, scrupulous and determined guardian, which does not hesitate for a second not only to signal a potential danger, but also to attack with unexpected energy whoever dares to violate the territory entrusted to it. At this stage, it should be pointed out that a French Bulldog is never to be underestimated. It's a small-sized dog, it is true, but it is a concentrate of around 10 to 14 kilos of muscles that make it a small but mighty athlete. Moreover, the conformation of the jaws allows it to bite with extraordinary power, and the determination inherited from distant fighting ancestors make it an adversary to be taken seriously. A French Bulldog with a correct temperament, also in its contained size and with the likeable and slightly odd appearance that makes it stand out, looks at the world from top to bottom, and its expression denotes boldness, confidence, courage, strength and tranquility. Its 30 centimeters of height contains such a genetic heritage that whoever observes a representative specimen of the breed cannot fail to be struck by the impression of strength and determination that it transmits. Through the mysterious tangle of the genetic paths, the characteristics of the distant molossoid progenitors have arrived at the bulldog, which had to face dangers and perils for thousands of years in order to survive. Hence its seemingly limitless courage which leads it to confront adversaries also much bigger than itself with total indifference as to the possible consequences. It is this same courage that induces it to attack any potential danger on account of the people it loves. Another characteristic inherited from ancestors is its attachment to its master. During long movements, the break to eat a frugal meal with man, the nights spent together guarding the flock or waiting for the passage of game, or keeping watch in anticipation of battle in which both would have put their lives at stake, a joint symbiosis of states of mind, hopes, fears and also affections has developed between man and dog. Among the many stories reaching us, there is a symbolic one. It is that of Alcibiades, the Athenian general who lived four centuries before Christ, who, in a battle against Xerxes, the king of the Persians, was struck by some arrows. The Molossian dog that accompanied him and watched over his life, although wounded and dying, pulled them out from his flesh with its teeth, thus saving him. Alcibiades, grateful and touched, had the dog buried with full honours. The French bulldog loves its family, even if, as often happens with dogs, it will then choose just one of its members as its master and will elect him, her, as leader of the pack, respecting this person as its only superior and accepting with affection the other members as its peers. All members of the breed are gentle and reliable with children. They will play with their small friends for hours without problems, also accepting a little bit of rough behaviour. You will need to be careful if the dog is welcomed into a home where there are still no small children in the family, since the attachment to its master could make some bulldogs quite jealous. Therefore, with the arrival of the first child, it will be a good idea to keep an eye on the dog's reactions for a while. In a short time, it will learn to live alongside its sibling, and there will be no more problems. Naturally, if there are already other small children at home, then nothing should happen. We've seen that many bulldogs are quite jealous. They do not want to see you pay compliments to the dogs of others. They do not want to be confined to a room of the house when some guests are present. They do not want food to be given to other animals. And above all, they do not like being left alone. This is something that must be considered, and it is preferable that right from the start the puppy grows accustomed to being left alone for a certain length of time to avoid annoyances of various kinds later on. Initially, it should be done for brief periods, to then be increased more and more until having complete autonomy. Seeing you return each time after being left, the dog will understand that it is a temporary and not definitive situation and will calm down. 
The Molossians that went hunting or to war or protected flocks or villages had to possess exceptional willpower in addition to courage so as to allow them to pursue a prey for hours or to fight to the last breath in defence of somebody or something. Here is why another character aspect of the French Bulldog is stubbornness. If it fixes an idea in its head, it will not be easy to get it to change idea. In this case, the best way is to distract its attention with things which it finds more interesting, but this does not absolutely mean that with the distraction having passed, your adorable stubborn pet will not revert to the previous idea. The last aspect of the temperament inherited from ancestors that is worth considering is that which concerns combativeness. The ancient Molossians fought, hunted, confronted enemies and dangers, and to do this, besides courage, they also had to possess high levels of aggressiveness and considerable bellicosity. They are the characteristics which the French Bulldog still possesses after all these centuries. This is why it is an effective house guardian and does not hesitate for an instant to confront potential intruders in a firm manner. Besides, its notable self-confidence means it will not easily bark at the slightest noise, but leads it to warn of any problem only if this could constitute a real danger. The negative aspect of this aggressiveness is that usually French Bulldogs, especially the males, do not accept other dogs of the same sex to a large extent, and if provoked, a fight is almost certain. Be careful, therefore, never to leave two male dogs together unattended. A too brief description of the character cannot finish without mentioning the sense of humour that the French Bulldog possesses. An acute sense of humour, a little toadyish, supported by a good-natured astuteness that allows it to succeed in obtaining forgiveness for everything and in practically always getting what it wants. A bit with its sweetness, a little bit with its stubbornness, and a little bit with its overwhelming charm. As for health, the breed does not present particular problems. Like all dogs with a short nasal channel, the French Bulldog could have some respiration difficulties during very hot spells. Therefore, you should not tire it or subject it to excessive physical exercise. Above all, be careful not to leave it locked in a car, in the sun, or in places with high temperatures, and make sure it always has plenty of fresh water available. Instead, no problems exist in cold conditions. A few cases of retinopathy have been found, albeit very rarely, as also some rare phenomena of dysplasia have shown up. As for the births, these are now performed with a large percentage of caesarean deliveries, not because it is essential, but since given present techniques this allows a very limited mortality in puppies and avoids overstressing the mothers with a long labour. This is the French Bulldog appearing in the new millennium an attractive and intelligent, brave and protective dog, but also very sociable, that will be an amusing and splendid canine friend to its master and family. A proper diet is essential to your dog's correct and full development so as to be able to keep it in perfect shape and health. Some people believe that dogs can eat virtually anything and therefore give their dogs all kinds of food, often recycling the leftovers from their own meals. This is a serious mistake since what may be digestible to us and a source of nourishing substances often cannot be digested by dogs or is unable to be metabolized. A final piece of advice. It sometimes happens that a dog loses its appetite and refuses food for one or even two days. This is a normal occurrence, and in these cases it is a good rule not to always leave a full bowl of food down for the dogs. Instead, the food should be removed after a short time. Present the bowl of food again at the following mealtime after having changed its contents. In the event of loss of appetite lasting for more than two days without the presence of side symptoms, or if it is accompanied from the outset by symptoms of general suffering or exhaustion, consult your vet immediately. It is very likely to be an ordinary ailment, but in this case it is not worth taking a risk, and it is better to seek reassurance from an expert. We will now begin with a brief description of a dog's digestive apparatus. 
As in all carnivores, the stomach is of large dimensions, whereas the intestine is relatively short. Initial digestion in the stomach takes from 3 to 8 hours, then the food passes into the intestine where the nourishing substances are assimilated, which are then transmitted to all the organs through the blood. The stomach's large capacity and the slow digestion process allow abundant meals to be eaten at fairly spaced out intervals. Naturally, to keep dogs in excellent health, it is necessary to provide them with all the elements that they require, that is proteins, carbohydrates, fats, vitamins and minerals. When dogs were carnivorous predators, these elements were assimilated by dogs through the animals that they hunted and which were generally herbivores. Afterwards, civilization has led it to feed differently, but it will always be necessary to provide dogs with the appropriate substances. Dogs produce energy from their diet which is then used for the maintenance of vital functions and movement. The more active a dog is, the greater the energy intake it will require. Without going into detailed food studies that would require a specific treatise, we can simply say that dogs particularly require fats or lipids, both of animal and vegetable origin, and it is these which provide the necessary energy and which accumulate in the organism to provide possible energy reserves. The proteins that make up the large part of the animal's body are also essential. These are indispensable to the formation of all the tissues, especially muscles, and also constitute the basis of hormones and the blood. They therefore represent an irreplaceable element in a proper diet, even more so in puppies which must build their bodies. Sources of protein are meat, cheese, eggs and fish which are well digested by dogs and also soya bean flour, peanuts, legumes which are however digested with more difficulty. An excess of proteins is harmful and can lead to various kinds of disorders depending on the conditions. Carbohydrates are not essential to a dog's diet. They are however very useful at the end of pregnancy. Starch which is the most important carbohydrate present in the diet, is poorly digested by dogs and needs to undergo preliminary treatment such as cooking, flaking, etc. This is why if you use pasta or rice as a food for your canine friend, it needs to be boiled for a long time to eliminate a large part of the starch present. Fibre, which often accompanies carbohydrates, is especially useful in the diet of sedentary dogs since it helps to prevent constipation, given the speed with which it passes through the alimentary tract. Vitamins are also necessary, even if in infinitesimal amounts. They are found in many vegetables and are synthesized by herbivorous animals. This is the reason why when a carnivore kills its prey, generally herbivorous, it immediately feeds on the intestines, where there are residues of partially digested vegetable matter. This also explains why, to your considerable annoyance, your dog often eats the excrement of herbivorous animals as soon as it gets the chance. A build-up of vitamins can be harmful and therefore, if you use pre-prepared feed, you should carefully check the substances contained in the feed before adding supplements and, if in doubt, consult your vet. Minerals are essential to the diet and are supplied by foods. Efficiency in certain minerals such as calcium, iron, potassium, sodium, copper and others can cause abnormal growth in puppies also with serious consequences and general debility in adult dogs or the onset of problems of varying degrees. There is excellent pre-packed feed on the market, both moist and dry types, that provide all the necessary elements for initial growth and to then keep your dog in top shape. Even if you use pre-packed feed, you will however be able to give some fruit or other food which your dog will find tasty taking care not to exaggerate and not to give harmful substances such as sweets, fried foods, rice dishes, fresh or soft doughy bread that are extremely harmful and which can also have very serious long-term consequences. Instead, if you want to prepare the food yourself, then follow the advice of the breeder who sold you the dog or your vet's advice. As a general rule, it is worth knowing that meat, ideally beef, is essential. If pork meat is given, it must be well cooked in order to avoid infections. Poultry, meat and rabbit are also fine, provided that they are completely boneless. Giblets, 
although less rich in nourishing substances, are well liked. Fish is an excellent food and is best given cooked. It is particularly advisable for low-fat diets for dogs with digestive or skin problems. It is also an excellent means with which to make the diet less monotonous. Eggs are appetizing and supply many nourishing substances. They are particularly advisable for puppies and suckling females. Yolks can be consumed raw, whereas the albumin should always be cooked. Fats, such as lard and oil, are always readily accepted by dogs and are particularly useful during moments of work or physical effort. One or two teaspoonfuls of oil added to food are always beneficial. Dry bread is a good energy source, but it must be well dried. It is also useful for cleaning your dog's teeth and for keeping them in good condition. Pasta and rice are very useful, but as we have already said, they should be cooked very well to eliminate starch, which is not easily digested. Fruit and vegetables, even if not essential, can be given to dogs that appreciate them. However, the nutritional intake is very slight and is only worthy of note for the intake of roughage. Needless to say, the final element which is essential to nutrition is water, fresh and plentiful, that must be available at all times. If in a bowl, it should be changed as often as possible, especially during hot spells. It is absolutely indispensable to dogs that eat dry and not moistened feed. The final aspect of the diet to take into consideration is the frequency of meals. From birth, puppies have their meals by following times that are spaced out by the instinct of the mother and the other siblings in the litter. The feeds are gradually reduced during weaning and are integrated with suitable foods that should be recommended by an experienced breeder or a vet. Between one and three months of age, weaned puppies should have four meals at regular intervals. From four to seven or eight months, the number of meals can be reduced to three, further reduced to two meals at eight to 18 months, and afterwards, if desired, down to just one meal a day, even if it is not harmful to continue with two. On the contrary, this is recommended by certain individuals. The decision to have a dog is an important one to make, which must be thought over carefully without ignoring some useful basic information. The vaccination prophylaxis must always be carried out with utmost care to try and protect not only the puppies but also adult dogs from the most common illnesses. Generally speaking, a puppy leaves the breeder after having been vaccinated at around 40 to 45 days with a triad vaccine against canine distemper, infectious hepatitis and parvovirus. A second quadrivalent vaccination, also including leptospirosis as well as the three ailments already mentioned, is generally carried out after three weeks. An additional vaccination can be carried out after a month, again quadrivalent, to be then replaced annually throughout the dog's lifespan. A dog can be vaccinated only if it is in perfect health and thus also free from endoparasites. Appropriate anti-helminthic treatment must be carried out normally twice a year. Different types of Ascarids exist, each of which specifically infests an animal species, man included, and there is practically no risk of zoonosis, that is, transmission of the infestation from dog to man. It is important that dogs are also kept free from ectoparasites, that is, those that live on dogs such as fleas and mites, both of which are hematophages. Moreover, fleas act as an intermediate host for a type of taenia. Numerous specific products exist to free dogs from these annoying parasites, but one must not forget to also carry out appropriate disinfesting operations in the areas where dogs live. The arrival of spring exacerbates the problems caused by undesired guests, the mites that arrive along with the initial spring warmth. A run in the meadows through woods, perhaps near groups of farmhouses and farms where there is livestock, can result in our canine friend returning home with mites, not necessarily since some factors may exist which make a dog more or less susceptible, also depending on its general state of health that can influence whether or not a dog will pick up these akari. They represent a grave danger to dogs because they transmit pyroplasmosis, a serious infection carried by protozoa of the pyroplasma species that affects pets and also causes death if not discovered and treated in time. 
The symptoms in its acute form are represented by fever, also sthenic, asthenia, pallor of the apparent mucous membranes, and hypochromia of the urine that can also become brown-black in colour. In advanced cases, jaundice and a comatose state which could possibly result in death. The mites suck blood for two or three weeks and once having mated, the female then detaches itself from the animal and deposits the eggs a week later. The deposited larvae, recognisable by their reddish colour, are minute, like tiny beads. They also look for a host on which to climb, sucking blood for several days. They then detach themselves and after a few days change into octopede nymphs of bluish colour. They become adults towards August or September. With the arrival of autumn, the adults immediately upon hatching then lay dormant in cracks in the ground until the next spring. In general, the mites attach themselves to less thick skin, such as ears, armpits, groin, between the digits of the paws. Therefore, as a precautionary measure, we should always examine our canine friends for signs of any undesired guests after a walk in the open. Correct dog hygiene starts with coat care. For most breeds, but not all, it is advisable to brush the coat almost daily in order to remove the hairs that have reached the end of their life cycle. The coat of many breeds requires specialised grooming which is to be carried out several times a year. One must not generalise about the fact that a shiny coat is a sign of good health, since in some breeds it should have a tendency to be dull. Dogs must not be washed too often so as not to damage the protective function of the sebaceous glands. The skin in normal conditions should always look clean without dandruff deposits or desquamations of any kind. Should cutaneous alterations appear, such as eczema, alopecic areas, i.e. hair loss and failure of hair regrowth, thickening or the appearance of abnormal pigmentation, consult your vet without delay. Cutaneous alterations due to mycosis or mange are spread by contagion, but only in the case of particularly debilitated animals and when one fails to observe the most basic hygienic rules. Claws must also be checked periodically. These are normally worn down in dogs that undergo normal physical activities, but it may be necessary to shorten them with the aid of a special tool. Oral hygiene should never be overlooked, and especially in miniature breeds, tartar removal is necessary from time to time because it can cause pyorrhea and bad breath. Certain bones are available on the market that besides constituting a treat for our four-legged friend, act as a natural toothbrush. In puppies aged between four and six months, the deciduous dentition is gradually replaced by the permanent one. Regular inspections of the mouth are advisable during this period to check that everything is okay. The existence of cardiopulmonary filariasis, a serious disease caused by a nematode parasite, Dyrophilaria imitis, or the blood and heart, has been known for several centuries, as has been known the important transmission mechanism of the disease by the mosquito for about a century. However, it is only in the last 20 years, due to the rapid diffusion of filariasis in dogs kept for company and work dogs, that research institutes, pharmaceutical companies and vets have paid increasing attention to the problem. It is therefore important that dog owners are also aware, even if in general terms, of the existence and phenomena of the parasitosis. The transmission of the disease occurs through the mosquito's sting, which takes up the filaria larvae by sucking blood from an infected subject to then inoculate them into another healthy dog. The high contagiousness of the parasitosis is therefore easily understandable, in addition to its seasonality, spring-summer. During a period of around six months, the larvae in the dog's blood grow into adult worms that are situated in the heart and pulmonary arteries. In turn, the adult filariae produce small larvae called microfilariae which will live in the blood. The dogs most affected are obviously those that spend more or less long periods outside, hence gun dogs, work dogs and those that sleep in the open. The damage induced by the presence of the filariae is of considerable seriousness for that which concerns the cardiocirculatory function and initially shown as a tendency for dogs to tire easily and the presence of a cough or respiratory dysfunction. The vet giving treatment at this stage will perform different clinical and laboratory tests that will confirm the presence of the parasites. 
On the contrary, the damage caused by chronic cardiopulmonary filariasis is extremely serious. The alteration of the cardiocirculatory function is often accompanied by liver and kidney lesions and a state of generalized hypersensitivity in the whole organism. The prevention programs that have only been practicable for a few years thanks to the use of specific new drugs are simple to carry out and do not involve toxicity risks for dogs. After having carried out a test to ensure the absence of a previous infestation, the oral administration of a medicine once a month for the duration of the entire hot season will give dogs effective protection also if they are stung by an infected mosquito. Even if there has been no shortage previously, or even now, of those who consider the French Bulldog as a native of France, the majority of experts favour the theory that its origins are to be found in the small Bulldogs reaching France from England. Here are the two theories. Those who think that the breed's origins are French, and among these is the known dog expert N.M. Martin, believe that it derives from small, powerful, but little-known stud farm dogs widespread in some Parisian suburbs, later crossbred with short-muzzled dogs from Belgium. Though admitting some crossbreeding with bulldogs and Carlini, these experts retain that the breed was formed in France and justify its name with the notable similarity with the bulldog. For the supporters of this theory, the French Bulldogs were the companions of porters, coachmen and butchers who used them to chase rats and in bloody fights between dogs. It's an interesting theory, which however... It is known that a certain Harrison imported some small toy Bulldogs, excellent ratters, in 1885 from France, and still another gentleman named J. Posno, also English, won a ratting competition with a French Bulldog. In 1904, the Illustrated Kennel News published a drawing of 1849 which portrayed a small one-year-old bulldog called Nottingham Frank, weighing about 22 pounds, 10 kilograms, and owned by a certain William Tupper from London, who possessed numerous other specimens of similar type. This toy bulldog bore a striking resemblance, except for its long tail, to the future French bulldogs. Even if one accepts the theory of distant English origins as being true, which however seems very likely, France is credited with having enthusiastically welcomed the small bulldogs to resolve. These dogs initially gained moderate public success in England, but then declined and became the companions of humble folk. Thus, the small bulldogs that were born in England, not considered valuable in their native land, arrived in France towards the middle of the 19th century, crossing the channel with English miners and workers who went there in search of work. Many of these emigrants were from Nottingham, the chief town of the county of Nottinghamshire, also where intense breeding of these small dogs took place that were commonly called toy bulldogs. They occupied little space in the modest homes of the miners and besides performed an invaluable service chasing rats from the houses. The people who emigrated to France after having settled often asked those staying in Great Britain to send them the small bulldogs so as to have a fragment of their country near them. Thus it was the start of a flourishing trade of toy bulldogs between England and France. It does not find confirmation in any written document and in no artistic representation. The French bulldog for breeding interests suddenly materialized in France towards the middle of the 19th century and immediately began its rise towards success. Instead, those who see the ancestors in the bulldogs from England explain that some small bulldogs started to be born in Great Britain towards the first decades of the 19th century, almost certainly as a result of crossbreedings between bulldogs and other breeds, among which the Carlino and most probably also the Manchester Terrier that apparently led to erect ears. According to the supporters of such a theory, these crossbreedings were carried out precisely to obtain dogs of smaller sizes to be used in ratting, 
that was increasingly catching on, or to be used to fertilize the female bulldogs in view of their first pregnancies, since the large heads that were becoming more and more frequent and in demand caused serious problems, which at the time were almost impossible for the primiparous bulldogs, having selected and fixed their type, getting them recognized by the official dog breeders, and having confirmed their worldwide success. The attribution of the breed's paternity to this country by the International Dog Federation is therefore correct and sacrosanct. Towards the end of the 19th century, more precisely between 1880 and 1890, also Austria already had some kennels of small bull that directly originated from England. In Vienna, the society accolade of the small bulldogs was granted when the Prince of Coburg imported Snob in 1888 thus imposing the breed on the court. Another important character of Viennese high society was the owner of the hotel Erzerhog Karl, who also imported a toy bulldog. Both these dogs originated from England, and both were white and dappled. It is believed that the preference of the Viennese for this colour derives from this detail, while in France the striped coat was usually 